Hi, I'm Dave Kittredge, filmmaker in Los Angeles, and this is The Outcast, presented by Outfest, where we have conversations with LGBT creators and allies to discuss their work, their inspirations, their passions, and the challenges of getting our authentic voices heard. And today, I am so thrilled to have performance artist, musician, sculptor, and now director of the acclaimed Netflix documentary Circus of Books, Rachel Mason. Hello, Rachel. Hi, David. <laughs> and joining us as well is Rachel's younger brother, who has a pivotal role in the documentary and, you know, just by extension, their lives in this in this story. Josh Mason, welcome, Josh. Yeah, thank you. So, Rachel, I'm going to start with you. I've been so looking forward to this interview because last year at 2019, it was, you know, Circus of Books with the Outfest opening night film, and they don't do that very often with documentaries. And everyone knows Circus of Books in Los Angeles. It's kind of like a gay mainstay kind of rite of passage uh, to go into Circus of Books and get something. Tell me, how, just like, let's just start. How did the film come about? Well, you know, I come out of the queer universe myself and just my entire friend group since I was in high school was obsessed with the store, myself included. And I just always thought it was a really cool place. And I sort of took it for granted that it was always going to exist. And then when my mom became really serious about closing it in 2015, you know, I had heard for many years that she was serious about closing it, but then it was really like, no, 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 it's actually going to close. And I just had this very rude awakening to the world of, you know, Los Angeles without Circus of Books. And, you know, I talked to a producer about it. I talked to different people about it. And I just thought I'd always knew that it was an important story that needed to be told somehow. And I never quite had the right moment in my life to do it. And it wasn't that I decided to do it at this moment. It was that if I don't do it now, it won't happen because I know how fast my mom moves and how, (laughs) you know, and how little nostalgia she has for any of it, that it would have all just wound up closing instantly without any documentation. So history really was my guide. I had to do it. Otherwise, it wouldn't have happened when it did. I mean, that's fantastic. So everybody knows who's been involved in documentaries you start with a gajillion hours of footage like how how did you even approach this with your editor and how did you start to put together the assembly you know I just had many 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 hours of footage that we started with when I just started filming in earnest which was about I think 2015 and that footage combined with archival footage that things that we needed to dig up while we were trying to tell the story interviews and a mix of verite things that were happening ongoing while we were making the editing and including things like I reshot the interview with Josh because I realized halfway through and Micah my other brother that these interviews needed to be first person and they had to be they had to be refilmed because I initially started the film with Cynthia Childs a really wonderful producer and me doing it together. And I was not behind the camera taking the lead until the edit happened. And I realized, oh my God, all of like the best, most interesting moments were when people were literally like Larry Flint saying, you know, Rachel, your parents were my first distributors. And I had been not wanting to be a part of the film as, you know, the POV storyteller, I had just figured I'd be just like a talking head like anyone else. And then looking at the film, it was clear in the edit that I had to, you know, really reshape it. And, you know, people ask me like, oh, were you setting out to make like Sarah Pauly's, you know, family investigation? No, not at all. I was actually setting out to really minimize my family's role in it and make it all about just the store and the value of gay porn for a generation of men that needed it. And I wasn't really that interested in diving into the really heavy and painful experience of my brother and my mom and all the things that have become what has made the film so great really was not what I set out to do. So the film really told me what it needed to be as I made it. It was really a moment in the theater when we were, when all of us, I think, were first seeing it in 2019, when Josh started to tell his story. Because, I mean, you know, going back two steps for anyone who hasn't seen this documentary, and you should, you should just immediately go home and watch it on Netflix. Circus of Books uh, was kind of a legendary gay porn, like, emporium, one in West Hollywood and one in Silver Lake. 
And, you know, you would get your lube there, you would get your poppers there, but you would get porn there, you would get dildos there, you would get all sorts of stuff there, but it was kind of a safe space for gay men. And, and this was all through the AIDS crisis, this was all through the 80s, all through the 90s. And the documentary looks at the entire history of this, but also in the second half, we depict Josh, who's the, the son of the, you know, the two proprietors, your, your guy's parents, who comes out of the closet and your mom has a very, very difficult time with it. Um, Josh, why don't you like, you know, kind of tell us, I mean, I know you talk, tell the story in the film, but tell me what it was like kind of reliving it for Rachel's camera. <laughs> um, I actually tried to avoid it as much as I could. I think, um, I think the first time we filmed it, I was, I felt like I would be much more comfortable not talking about it in front of my siblings. I pre-screened the questions. I think I, I actually you were very think careful. I was, yeah, I mean, I didn't think I was divulging anything Rachel hadn't heard before because you know I think it was it was a bit of a traumatic period I sort of feel like the my certainly my mother has relived it hundreds of thousands of times as she keeps repeating it so I I tried to just get it out without too much fanfare too much new information and to my surprise um, there was a lot that we hadn't talked about and I think since the filming we have talked more about it as a family in this it's we we become more open about what was going on in that period. So it's been it's been very nice. But the camera thing was definitely a new experience. <laughs> I was pretty nervous. Well, but one of the most moving parts was when Rachel it, and and I want to talk more about your decision to kind of shoot yourself shooting the documentary because that's a very unconventional kind of thing, even when documentarians put themselves in movies, it's like, you know, to, to the cutaway to you, especially during this interview, when you start to cry and Josh says, are you okay? I mean, I feel like I've seen this scene in reality with so many gay friends of mine, uh, because we've all like, you know, when we come to the point where we come out, we've processed it. And it's like we're going over it, and, and I think everybody else has to play catch up in a way. Like, was this part of the, the reshoot, that one thing? Because that that moment is really the the emotional linchpin of the entire movie, for me at least. You know, it's so amazing to hear that because that also was the least expected moment for me. I knew I needed to get that interview again, and I felt actually terrible that we had to reshoot it. But I knew that when I had looked at the original footage of it, you know, it just it didn't have the heart and soul because I wasn't doing the interview. And I had actually kept myself out of that interview because I figured Josh could just be more forthcoming with, a, you know, with Cynthia. And, and we had kind of discussed it. I had a different approach st starting the whole thing. And then when I was just needing to really go back in and redo all these interviews, it was very clear. It was just because it was a POV film now. It was like, this is the, my story. So I figured I would get through it. We'll have this interview. And then you know, Josh, who's right here, I can say, Josh, you said this thing that I just, it really broke my heart. I actually have to say, because I was the older sister and I took a girl to prom and I was like out and being weird. And, you know, I didn't ever say, fuck you, I'm gay. But basically I was like, fuck you, I'm not going to ever conform to whatever you guys want me to do. Because I'm an artist. You were the, you were the Hellraiser. You were yeah. the one that was the out Hellraiser. Yeah. And Josh was kind of the best little boy in the world kind of thing, right? He was totally the best little boy in the entire world. And, and my, you know, the favorite child that was perfect. And, you know, I, in a strange way, just didn't have any space for Josh in my adolescence. I was I was wrapped up in the Ron Athies and Vaginal Davises of the world who were like <laughs> rubbing blood on shit with, you know, AIDS in it. I'm like, yeah, this is my scene. I love all you people. It's so great. And, you know, and so then I remember just thinking, you know, when we were doing this interview, Josh, you know, said that thing. I just was like, what the fuck, Rachel? Where were you? Are you kidding me? Josh was going through this alone. And I remember thinking, like, really, I felt ex such guilt that I just was a, you know, a selfish teenager wrapped up in my own world. And, um, you know, the struggle of, like, a normal gay kid was not sort of in my, I hadn't made space for it. And Josh, of course, is, you know, I love Josh more than words. And I just couldn't believe that here I was suddenly now thinking about what he was dealing with in such a profound way. It, it just, it, it, it really killed me kind of. But I also know that Josh didn't want to make me feel bad. I just, I know that Josh is also, you know, didn't want to make me, my mom or anyone feel bad because 
you know, I think that that's also, you had already processed it, Josh. I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I had a feeling that you weren't looking to go back in and dig up old wounds again. Yeah, I, I pretty much thought I'd close the lid on that chapter and put it to bed. But um, yeah, I think there was there's still some stuff coming out. I think people's reactions to that scene, I feel like a lot of people have explained me to myself after that. Just through, even through these, um, through the messages I'm still getting, that's that's great. Um, yeah, they're really clarifying for a lot of that. Well, I'm glad they're clarifying. I would I, honestly, I would find them a bit disorienting. I think at first it was um, well. I think the idea of everybody knowing my coming out story, I do sort of feel like that one moment in my life was like the most kind of prized, tightly wrapped kernel, and and the fact that it's out there, it genuinely feels like. Like anything else is insignificant, so um, so I yeah I think it's it's quite it's quite nice hearing people's reactions to it and their own coming out stories, um, and then obviously in the context of my mother and the family and how Rachel kind of responds to that scene, it's all been really revelatory. Well, it sounds also very healing because it sounds I mean I, you know tell me if I'm wrong Rachel but it it sounded like when you were we, we, when you were talking about it there was like a hint of resentment there that you were kind of the out one you know like doing the crazy stuff and here's this perfect little kid who's the who's the favorite i mean in any in any family i think that would be resent i i, I would have been resentful do you mean like that josh could have been resentful of me no 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 you were you were resentful of josh that he was the favorite and the and the golden boy and all that stuff and you were the you were the ass kicker and then when he came out you're like you know, however you felt about it. Well, you know, in a strange way, I think I, I actually think that I've done my own processing since the film because I never bothered to come out, quote unquote. And, I, you know, to be honest, I'm such a nonconformist that I don't even conform to like the LGBT rules of like how you have to come out. And I've always felt like everything is bullshit that anyone comes up with to tell me what to do. Like, no, right. I'm not going to follow your rules either. You know, those are good qualities to have in a filmmaker, <laughs> by the way. You know, I will say now that Buck Angel is my lover and it's like the first person I think I've ever been with that is like as much of an outlier as me where he actually is the same way. Like you have rules, <laughs> fuck you. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, it's so funny. Like I relate to that. Like people want to come up with boxes and I, I think in a way I resented this idea that you have to come out, you have to do these things, you have to do... Like, I just felt like the definition of gay to me is freedom. And so, you know... This whole thing of like, okay, well now I have to be gay in this way and tell my parents that I'm gay. And I just had this, I don't think I had space for the particular thing Josh had to go through for himself because I had my own particular thing that was so rebellious and precocious, I guess. And just, I, I am a nonconformist and, and, mm. and in a strange way, I don't think I respected that some people just do want to conform and they want to actually right. have a normal quote unquote life and their normalcy might be so against society in the 90s and in the 80s i mean being gay was just actually against the rules of our society so and totally so, yeah and, and if you want to be a normal person like i think josh has always wanted to you know you, josh you're an engineer right you know you had ambitions you weren't setting out to be like a, a whack job weirdo and hang out with the um bloodletting artists who are gonna you know be on stage doing freaky shit and you know i just felt this sense of recognizing that i had not made space for that basic thing that josh actually had and has in his heart which is in and of its self nonconformist and how painful that is if you want to be accepted and be regular and part of our culture and you have it within you to to not be and that that could let your mom down which of course it did my mom was just like totally deflated for a moment and a hideous moment which I did want to capture on film because I think that that's also the thing that happened to so many parents and happens still and that a lot of parents don't come out the other side right regardless of whether or not they're peddling porn they say oh my god god has cursed me and now you have to be out of my life and I had had many people tell me you know my mother was your mother but she never came around well she also didn't run a porn empire I mean this is the power of the documentary 
documentary is that, you know, your parents, like it or not, normal seeming or not, ran one of the biggest gay porn companies really in the universe for over a decade or a decade and a half or whatever it was. Yeah. And they, and it wasn't just that they owned the shops, they were producing videos. They were producing gay pornography, like actual like videotapes, at the time videotapes, later DVDs. How can you be so upset about a gay son when your entire livelihood, your your entire professional business is catering to the gay community. Well, you know, I'll add to that. I know Josh, you should talk in a minute, but here's one thing. I feel like part of her reaction came from, and this is me, you know, just after the fact, looking back on it. Part of why I was just like, all right, whatever, who cares? It doesn't even matter if you're gay versus Josh, you know, my God, the the world is going to come crashing down. Lightning has struck me is partially because of their proximity to the AIDS crisis. And they saw young men that look exactly like Josh just get wiped out. And, you know, I think my dad's reaction was the right reaction, which was, Josh, you need to be safe. And there's a chance that you can get this horrible disease that will kill you. And that was the loving reaction. And I think I have to imagine, because I can't really imagine a different world, but that why there was such a problem with Josh being gay with my mom had to do with what she just witnessed, which was the most... It was fear. Yeah. And also yeah. just this brutal, I mean, horrible kind of death. It was, you know, really, it's strange, actually, that the film is coming out during the coronavirus because people dying in isolation in beds without really knowing what the cause of this disease is, that was actually AIDS. But yeah. nobody cared because it was gay men who people thought were sick and depraved. So they just saw, like, this horrific kind of death and lonely, horrible, isolated experience. And I think that that was a big part of my mom's particular reaction with Josh. But Josh, you can tell me what you think. I don't know. So I, I know that talking about her was sort of a small segment of the film and my coming out story. But that, I mean, we carried on talking till like, 3 in the morning. And then I left, and there was conversation before I went to the airport. And it was... She, she didn't sleep that night, but then she did come around and talk about safe sex and maybe got a bit a bit too intimate or tried to with, <laughs> with exactly how it's, how uh, how careful I was being. But I, I think the, the connection with Judaism, I feel like it sort of reflects how she was able to bend her relationship to the business and, and everything... If you if you understand uh, modern Judaism as sort of a an evolution and a questioning of ancient rules uh, to to try to apply them to current day, and it's just gradual bending of you know what is kosher, what what can you do on Friday night, and bending it you know, to what fits your current sort of reality. And I feel like that's sort of how they were able to find themselves in this business. And when I came out, that to her was like. Well, as she said it, that was that was that was God kind of ending her bending of the rules, and that's where that's where it stopped, and that's where it was going to come back. She feared, if that makes sense. Oh, it totally makes sense. I mean, you know, we every religious parent who's ever had a gay kid has always had to deal with. Okay, so this is what I believed. Now I know that there's a dissonance here because I know my kid and I love my kid, and. The, it, you know, they can't just for the way they are be, you know, doomed to hellfire or an abomination or all that stuff. I mean, this is this is a very, very, you know, this story has been played out so many times over the world. And it's really just astonishing to see it in this film in this context. I mean, it's almost too You couldn't have written this. Rachel, I want to talk to you a little bit about your career. You know, a lot of people know you from this film now because it's this big hit on Netflix. Everybody has seen this film and everybody seems to love this film. And, you know, but you are already have been and for years an established performance artist. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, I, I was established, but I wasn't really making any money. If you'll talk to my mom <laughs> about that. <laughs> it's really funny. Um, this whole thing of having a career is really hilarious because... Because um, I was always in the scene. I, in a strange way, I guess I came to join the people who were my heroes in art, in performance. Um, I, I went to Yale. I was a part of a really small 
community. If you you know the the world of art and artists is is pretty tiny. Um, museums, galleries, it's it's a small scene. And in a strange way, I feel like I just by virtue of the work that I was doing. My, my film right before this was an experimental art house film and it toured in and I, I toured it as like a live work of musical theater almost. The Lives of Hamilton Fish. Yeah, and, and I went to the LACMA and I, I basically was going to all the performing departments of different museums and then I, you know, I was doing other projects in the performing arts departments of, of museums, Red Cat, I did a really cool performance about black holes. And, you know, I was just sort of like growing at the edges of the art and museum world. And in a way, what, what do you do when you're kind of at that edge? You, you move into film sort of naturally. Like I can think of a few precedents for someone like me. It's like Miranda July or even like Yoko Ono. Um, or even going back to like Schnabel, Julian Schnabel. Or Laurie Anderson. You know, these are like yeah. my people. So they had this sort of cult following. And I don't know if I'm lucky enough to say I had a cult following, but I, I had a little group. You know, I was at the YMCA and somebody said, oh, my God. I saw your performance at LACMA and I thought, wow, that's so cool. Okay, that was like the extent of anyone knowing who I was that was like <laughs> a big deal to me. <laughs> you know, basically, this is a common story in the sense that every artist, especially every, you know, everybody kind of who dabbles in one way or another in the independent film, you know, we all have gigs that we get by on. I mean, I don't know a single, I, I honestly don't know almost any filmmakers who are making stuff who don't have their toe in something like marketing, in commercials, in promo, in editorial, in whatever. I mean, we all have to pay the bills. And, you know, in the last 10 years, especially with the advent of the internet, and this kind of goes back to the documentary circus of books, the internet has changed everything about distribution. The internet has changed everything about the way we view content and monetize content. And that goes back to every piece of art, except maybe with the exception of live performance, if you're lucky. Basically, we're all hustling, you know? Yeah. And, and But you're, I mean, the one thing I want to say about your CV, which is just, I mean, you know, not every, you know, hustling artist can say that they were the, you know, Whitney Biennial. You know, you can't, this is not a normal... <laughs> Your resume, you're underselling it quite a yeah, bit. Yeah, you know, it's funny, though, because being a performance artist, you get all kinds of crazy, cool, weird gigs. And, you know, I was in the Whitney Biennial by virtue of my friend Don Casper inviting me to perform in her piece. So I have all this, like, collaborative stuff. But, you know, I guess I will say I, I really am multimedia in spirit. I, I'm also a songwriter, and I included my song in the end credit of the film, and you know, working on the film, part of it felt like the least expressive thing I've ever done because I had to work so intensely with a producer and with an editor in particular, my editor, Catherine Robson. I mean, she, you know, I, I had that feeling at the end. I was like, damn it, you're the real artist. I'm not doing anything. And, you know, it felt very like painful to just be sort of waiting for so long for her great edit work. And then I would come in and, you know, rejigger it and do what I needed to do and add the music I felt. But it felt this strange sense of like, okay, you know, and I had my side hustle of teaching and I taught at UCLA, I did different things, um, tons of side hustles. But for me, the, the most creative aspect of the film was when I got to write the end credit song and then I made a music video for it, which I which is really cool. And I got Peaches to be in it and uh, Bucking. Oh my God. Is it, this is not in the film though. Can we see this? Yeah, you just have to look for it on YouTube. The song is called Give You Everything. And the song's also on Spotify. And I did a remix with Man Parrish, who was, you know, one of the legends of gay electronica. And in fact, he is still alive. And I found him when I was looking for Patrick Cowley tracks to use in the film. And this great label called um, Dark Entries Records had the estate of Patrick Cowley. And that's where we got the tracks. And then, as it turns out, he introduced me to Man Parish. But for me, it was really important to also include like the lifeblood of gay porn music, which is the foundation of dance music to this day that we all listen to on the radio. You know, Katy Perry, Lady Gaga, all the big... You know, everyone is actually thumping to house music that came out of gay culture. The proto house, the Junior Vasquez early 90s that has just stayed with us the whole totally. period. Totally. And I, you know, it's my little hidden thing that was my artistic piece of the film was to actually pay homage to the really great artists who we lost mostly in, in just the music of the film. So it's actually a gay electronic dance music is the foundation of the Circus of Books music. 
I want to call out one thing about the film that I think is just really special. And I'm saying this because he's also a friend of mine. The graphics and the titles. Grant Nellison. Yeah. Okay, I've known Grant for a while. Oh, that's so and cute. every time he has a new movie, it's just like, I can't wait to see what he does. I love the opening titles so much. And I love the gra- like the Jeff Stryker graphics with the 80s thing coming. Like, it's amazing. I'm very glad you're calling Grant. In fact, Grant needs to be called out a lot more because it's so interesting how little I've spoken about his work. And, you know, he also, yeah, the opening title sequence. So that was an idea, a concept that I'd had the whole time. It was one of my thoughts of like, okay, my very favorite thing about the store is the mix of ephemera, like the <laughs> the bow ties. The behind the scenes office yeah, thing. Yeah, and then like the, the handwritten like, Popper's note on the wall, you know, <laughs> that to me was like the piece of gay culture that was going to die if I didn't get it right then and there, you know, the campy humor and all of the lube and Popper's bottles and everything else. So when I showed that idea to Grant, it was one of those things where, okay, if you can't execute this well, it's going to fail. And if you execute this well, it's going to be the most iconic gay thing ever. And he rocked it and I couldn't even believe it. It was just he, he, he just just rocked it. And then also he did other things like I was trying to translate the idea that my dad had special effects skills, which he applied to um, dialysis machines. From Star Trek to dialysis. It's amazing. No, and it's really hard when you talk to a graphic designer, you know, to say, how can you help me translate this? And Grant just knew how to do it so beautifully. The idea of like... We, we we brainstormed a lot together. And, and to me, actually, that was the most collaborative piece of the film, again, artistically. And he's just a total brilliant graphic designer. I mean, you're a real artist, actually. So, yeah, shout out to Grant and Allison. It, it just makes the film, like, those sections when they're talking about, like, when they're, it's about midway through and they're talking about getting into porn production, like, you know, out, out of like, out, and, and we're talking about Matt Sterling, the famous producer. And then we talk about Jeff Stryker and all of his stuff. And it's just, those graphics just make it work so well. And I will say another little thing. I think it really did matter that Grant like got it because when he, when yeah. I said Jeff Stryker and he just started cracking up and was like, oh yeah. Like, I'm like, do you know Jeff Stryker? And it's like. You know, you needed to, if I had worked with anyone that didn't quite get the, like, do you understand (laughs) Jeff Stryker? It was so great because he got all of the perfect mix of, like, crazy, ridiculous, cheesy perfection that was, like, the package of that. And also the, like, the honcho blue boy covers. And, you know, he just understood the campy humor that um was so necessary yeah the the gay angels who are watching over this film handed me grant for sure (laughs) it feels that way (laughs) do you want to know more about outfest of course you do you're listening to this podcast Outfest is the only LGBTQIA arts, media, and entertainment nonprofit organization in the world whose programs empower artists, communities, and filmmakers alike to transform the world through their stories while also supporting the entire life cycle of their career from outset to legacy. And what that means is it is one of the largest LGBT film festivals in the world and one of the largest film festivals in North America. Also, Outfest has a tremendous number of programs for young filmmakers as well as archivists preserving gay stories for all time. It is a truly outstanding organization. And especially right now, we would love your help. Please go to outfest.org and learn how you can become a member of this fantastic organization. Josh, I wanted to ask you, you're a few years younger than me, because I came out in 92. I think you came out probably a bit later than that. 2000. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a bit. I, I came out late. It was late. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, how old were you? At 20. Oh, that's not late. I came out at 22. That's. I, that, I was that's giving you a softball there, but okay, <laughs> I wear my age as a badge of honor or something. I don't know. Um, but, you know, you must have... Tell me, like, because I worked in a video store when I was 15, and I smuggled out a gay porn tape. Like, I remember my first under my jacket smuggling out just for the night. I was working the next day. No one would have missed it. 
Like, please tell me you did something like that with Circus of Books. I never, I never did that. I like Rachel's. I was much more of like a rule follower. I feel like I, 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 um, yeah, didn't like to get in trouble. And I think we were generally pretty well supervised when we were in the, we were in there. So I certainly, I certainly saw what was going on, and <laughs> um, I, I knew, I knew all, what all that stuff was. I mean, even before I was a teenager, I think I knew implicitly what gay sex was but i never no i never i never took advantage of that massive opportunity as i would say now <laughs> so so the first i mean the first exposure you had to pornography was not anything to do with circus of books that your parents ran for 20 years no i was i kind of joined everybody else with like aol chat rooms and stuff like that <laughs> wow i really failed to ask the right questions you're putting me to shame here <laughs> I, I don't know i don't know if i would have um i would have talked all this stuff back when you were filming i think this is definitely opened up quite a bit well you seem a lot more relaxed talking about this stuff now than i mean because in the film even in the film you're extremely reserved and it works for the film but like even in this conversation i'm i'm, I'm watching you over zoom now as we're recording and it's like you seem like yeah that you know it's you, you've kind of grown into it you know i think at the time i didn't know what was happening i was doing all our work in the middle east i think i was i was a bit more concerned about what the ramifications might be obviously um, how the film was going to be received I was worried about how like my parents would be contextualized and everything, but the response has been incredible. And the fact that it's on Netflix and, and my coming out stories on Netflix is really like, pff, who, who cares? Like this, this, <laughs> that really was like the, the, the smallest nugget of my personal fears is now everywhere. So, um, you but know. isn't that empowering? I mean, you've helped a lot of people out there. There are a lot of gay boys and probably gay girls and probably non-binary people who will watch Circus of Books and be like, that's, you know, not that their parents, you know, run a porn emporium, but it's like, that's my story too. Yeah, that, I think I'm, I'm still trying to find my mechanism for talking about it. But the reaction has been, I can see my parents and your parents, their reaction was the same as mine. And I kind of, I, I did ultimately agree to do the film because I was hoping that, you know, when I was growing up and coming out, there just weren't documents like this, like public representations of coming out stories and family evolutions around a gay child, or, I mean, I put gay child in quotes because that's sort of the, the changed character, but now you have gender issues, which just doesn't even touch on... Um, but it's that sort of like the evolution and the understanding and the and the connection. There wasn't that sort of archive available, and now that it's out there, it, it is very nice to be able to have contributed to other people's personal understandings of themselves. So, Josh, you have a fiance. Yes. You've broken the hearts of everyone who had watched that documentary, I have to say. Um, how long have you guys been together? Uh, coming on to eight years, actually. Oh, my so goodness. Quite, quite a long time, yeah. How'd you guys meet? <laughs> hmm. Oh, you're, oh, come on, come on. I, I think well, I know. I suppose we... just, just from the hesitation, I feel like I know the answer because it's yeah, probably the probably same did. answer. It's probably the same answer that I have with my boyfriend. Uh, and at least three friends have with their boyfriends, but but go ahead if you want to tell the lie, tell the lie. If not, that's fine too. Yeah, no, we we met on Grinder. There you go. Uh, there it yeah. is. There it is. I, so I well, I tell my I still tell my mother <laughs> that we met online, and I think she's. We all have that. We all, all of us. I have that story. All of my friends who are in this situation have this story. It is surprising how many gay couples I know. I almost the majority in the last five years who who met on Scruff or Grinder or something like that. Back when Grinder was about dating, that's when you know when it was about getting to know somebody. Was it really? Was it ever? Re come on. Was it ever really about dating? Come on. Yeah. You know, for me, we we definitely had we definitely had a long kind of conversation online before we met. Oh, that's so sweet. And is he is he British? I know you're in London. Yeah, he's British. I think I'll he he probably likes a little less attention, so I won't go too. I, I, we don't have to talk about. I virtually it. have to keep it keep it limited there. Do you have a wedding date set? No, we just yeah. I think we we were sort of in the process of kind of figuring out what kind of wedding we were going to have and then everything fell apart i was traveling quite a bit he was we're both sort of very 
um, career orientated, as you say here. Um, <laughs> so the the wedding thing was kind of on the back burner. Obviously, with eight years, it's not it's not a huge rush. It's not going to surprise anybody. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Oh, that is so sweet. That is so sweet. And it's it's funny because like you look at those those shots of you in Circus of Books when you were like coming out and haltingly and even when you're talking to your sister you're very very reserved and very kind of like you know you're even there for her when she has her breakdown as we we talked about before like when she like starts crying and and uh you seem very much kind of like the the glue that that holds it together for your family I think because I've lived abroad for so long when I come together everyone flies in everyone meets up it's very much like a a moment so I think it's because I've not lived in LA since 98 really I think when I come back it is a bit of a bonding moment for everybody every I think the focus is to try and make it a happy fun time so I think I've kind of also built myself into the expectation that when I go back I have to be on I have to kind of be exciting and pull everybody together that sort of thing does your family love your fiance yeah more than me, I think. It's <laughs> <laughs> That's always a good sign. Yeah, I, I know you're. It's it's kind of odd talking to you about this because you're not, you're not, you know, you're not a performer, you're not an actor. You're in this documentary, which all of these people have you know seen and been moved by. But it's basically your personal story. You're not, you're not in the entertainment business. Yeah, I mean this the the whole. This whole film has really knocked me sideways because it's it's not something I normally talk about. Kind of my personal I, part of what I like about England is everything just goes under the carpet and they move on. I think the, the, <laughs> for better they go or worse. To the pub. Yeah, for better or worse. So yeah, I think I I tend to challenge myself in architecture and engineering and the unknowns in that space in terms of gender and identity and person. I'm open to it. I have no kind of um, expectations on that front, but I'm not used to being a speaker. And certainly PFLAG, I've only been a couple times. My parents have brought me, which it's amazing to be there and to see it and to be involved. But, yeah, your um, mom got super involved in the film, like in, involved in PFLAG kind of work. But was that for, I, mean, it, I got the sense that that was her working out her own issues with regard to this and trying to be there for you simultaneously, but it was both. Big time, yeah. I mean, we, she wasn't... I wouldn't say she was an advocate for the first year. She was definitely a participant. And I think she said she went to the first meeting or two without saying anything. And it was it, it was definitely a cracking open of the conversation. When it turned into her advocacy, I actually, I actually started to feel a little guilty because I felt like I'd given her... Like, there were almost more expectations because now now she had to prove that she was... She had come around the corner, <laughs> and she could have a yeah. The she she have a you, gay son and all the rest of it. That you being okay with, she was okay with you being gay and all that stuff. She had to, she had to prove it. Yeah, which I don't think she, I don't think that was necessarily the intent. I think that was me kind of uh, projecting my expectation of of where she was going. But she was, she and my dad were both, you know, they'd go out to protests and they, they, my dad can quote the Bible against you know, even the most ardent Christian zealot. He's, 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 which is, he's such a calm, cheerful, happy guy. But then when it comes to this topic, he's a real fighter. Both of them are. It's been, it's been quite um, overwhelming at times. Well, but it's, and it's also challenging because you, you know, in, in your early twenties and certainly in your teens, you know, as gay men, we, we, we're just, forming our identities you know when we come out and stuff like that and and everybody kind of reacting around us is almost secondary to like who am i what do i want you know it's like you know it's i remember a period where like you know a lot of people went through it's like um you know am i into leather you try on a leather thing like no that's not for me or that is for me or whatever am i into this am i into that do i like cute guys do i like nerdy guys do i like strong guys do i like older younger whatever you know Whatever it is, I mean, we have to kind of go through all of that with ourselves and try to figure out who we are because there's no roadmap for how to be a gay guy, really. Yeah, I mean, the funny thing about when well, I was in New York at that time, um, I was—I feel like there's a there's a bar for every single one of those um, categories that you mentioned. And I'm probably into most of them at some point. <laughs> 
Um, but that was that was part of it. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. It was it was a bit of a long, bumpy journey for me. I think I didn't, certainly didn't want to be gay back at the beginning. Um, it's not it's not the culture that I grew up in. I was very much into hip hop and and you know I was that sort of um, that sort of thing. And so when when I realized I couldn't avoid it anymore. I think that's when it, that's, it was after a couple of years I finally came home, did the, did the big coming out and, um, and moved on. I think I had really built up that shell so much that when I came out and I threw the post-it note, I was done. Some of my suggestions which, to people which have been a little tongue-in-cheek is if you're struggling to come out, write it on a post-it, throw it on the table, and walk out. Which is... <laughs> Which is, it sounds, I think it sounds better than it is. It's a little, it's a Very little diva. Harsh. Yeah. It's not, it sounded a bit diva, though. I just want to tell all our listeners, by the way, you have a beard now. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is a different look and you wear it very well. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's quite, I don't know, it's quite ginger. It's really ginger. I you mean, need to I put was, this on your Instagram immediately. I swear. It's, it's out there. <laughs> I think... It's up there. I think one of the first pictures was a year ago at the or a year and a half at the the um, Tribeca Film Festival. That's sort of where I started the Instagram. Um, I still don't quite understand the Instagram universe, but uh, yeah, I'm figuring it out. And so there's 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 snippets up there, but there's a lot of beard. Rachel, I want to ask you about something, uh, and this is somewhat personal because you apparently studied under one of my absolute favorite LA artists, John Baldessari. Yeah, no, he was my mentor. What yeah. kind of influence did he have on your work, either in the film or, or outside the film? You know, I would say John's influence on me was more as a human being. Like, John taught me that to be a successful person, you do not have to be, nor should you be, an asshole. Like, he was the nicest guy you would maybe ever meet. And I, I remember just, he would give me these little lessons. Like, I remember the very first time I went on an outing with John to art galleries. And John is like, a tow literally towering. He was six foot seven, huge, like, had this oh my iconic God. look about him. And um, we met a gallerist who walked right up. You know, everybody was like, oh, my God, John's here. So he goes, hi, my name is John Baldessari. And then I stuck my hand out and I was like, oh, yeah, hi, I'm Rachel. And John goes, Rachel, say your full name. And then I realized, wait, you just said John Baldessari. Of course they know who the hell you are. So I was like, you know, I, re I realized he was giving me a little bit of a business skill right there. He's like, you say your name, Rachel Mason. He's like, that's actually how you do it. And, um, you know, how do you think I got to where I am, where people know that I'm John Baldessari? So he would give these little nuggets. And, you know, he had no reason to give a shit about me. And, I, and it was so interesting because I went to school with all the top dogs in the art world, like Charles Ray, Larry Pittman, um, just you name it, Chris Burden, the, the, the art stars of the universe happened to all collide at UCLA when I was there. And John of the top faculty would actually show up to like the backyard weird apartment show that a friend would do, you know, like not even like the Regan projects, fancy gallery show. He would just show up and he would usually like buy something, a trinket. I mean, he was, he was the epitome of generous and by far the most successful of all of the artists. So I remember thinking like in a weird way, I was like, wow, they're such assholes. They're not coming to my show. But on the other hand, I was like, no, actually John is just like an incredible outlier who is so like a mensch. And it, you know, in a strange way I see in the film world right now, similarly, Jill Soloway is mm -hmm. just such a freaking giver, you know, like certain people. I was just with Jill the other day and like, Jill likes to be a mentor and you look at people in this position where you're like, you have absolutely no reason to be this generous. Like, why are you being this generous? And, and you just think, okay, because maybe that is what makes a better world. It's what makes the world go around. And it's the definition of greatness, I think, is to actually be really generous. And, you know, so I think I've learned that I learned that lesson from John, um, just as a human to, and, and, you know, he just died a few weeks or I guess a few months ago. And it was like, yeah, 
I felt so sad, but I also felt like, okay, wow, I'm so lucky that I got to know him and, you know, and, and be able to share that message of his. So I'm glad you're reminding me because I do think it's an important message, you know, especially now that I'm in like Hollywood land and I have an <laughs> agent, you know, it's like be generous. It's really important. And I, I, I feel like in a funny way, as soon as I got into Hollywood land and got my agent, I met Jill. Actually, I just hung out with her and it was like that message of like, okay, no, be a real person, be generous, give back to this community. Um, you know, I love that about what they do, Jill Soloway, and just also feel this sense of like, you know, I want to be in that scene of people. Um, and, and like Ryan Murphy too, you know, making content that is going to give back to this community and that he's the mentor mm -hmm. of the film, you know? Well, it also makes you a better artist, I think, to be that generous. I mean, the, the people that I've met in the business who who are very big and yet very generous are always the ones who are going back to authenticity, most authentic in who they are as an artist and who they are as a person. Totally. And you know what's so interesting about generosity? It's really funny. I was actually just talking to Buck about this recently because <laughs> I'm laughing only because like he's won so many awards in the X Biz and like Gavian and all the big ones. And he said recently, you know, we were watching the Oscars and it was like Martin Scorsese and Quentin Tarantino again and no women directors were nominated. And he was so yeah. outraged. He's like, why don't those guys step down? Like, really, what is up with that? And he was like, I stepped down when I knew I was going to get my third or fourth AVN award, like let someone else come in. That's the Oscars of porn, by the way. So, you know, let someone, <laughs> someone else can come in and take this position. And like, that's actually a great thing. Like, why do I need like five of those awards? It's, it's actually, it starts to get weird and redundant. So I was thinking about that. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Like why don't the Scorsese's and the, you know, Tarantino's hand the baton. There's so many people who actually, have new material, new voices, want to say something different and should be given that the torch. So it was interesting. I, I totally agree. I think passing the torch isn't like making your shadow, you know, making you recede into the shadows. It actually it fuels the fire. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that Greta Gerwig gets a nomination soon because that Little Women I thought was just lovely. Rachel, what's next for you? So I have a fiction project that I'm working on and I also have a couple of doc projects that are in development and so what's next for me is um, the the work that I'm doing in in fiction and doc and I I, I want to be able to say a whole lot more but I sort of can't only because it's like fear of like speaking too soon but also just like some of it is in development that I can't you know let the cat out of the bag but I have docs totally. and fiction projects in the works and I'm really psyched about it so well I cannot wait to see whatever is next for you please tell me you're going to do some performance art though you know I'm going to squeeze it in and do uh, music as, and art as much as I can basically that's you know there's all this downtime when you're having your meetings and doing all the hardcore um, work that it takes to make a film that's actually not glamorous and interesting. You're just sitting around having Zoom meetings. So <laughs> that's every, Everybody's having Zoom meetings in, in uh, Corona land in 2020. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so Rachel, um, where can people contact you or reach you? You have a Twitter? Yeah, um, actually Twitter, it's, it's all Rachel Mason Art. I put art at the end because why not? I guess I'm the artist of the Rachel Masons. It's a very common name. <laughs> so, and then also um, I, my Instagram is future clown and that comes from the, one of my characters. Future clown is a art avatar. So you can look up future clown and you can also look up circus of books doc. Just basically type it into Google and I should somehow miraculously be able to be found. And Josh, do you want people finding you? <laughs> um, Do you want to be out there on social media in the big bad wild west of social media? I've I've dipped a very cautious toe into Instagram with Josh Mason five thousand. That's sort of where I'm curating what I'll present and trying trying to be as like open and flexible as Rachel, but curating not as within the rules that I have to live with it within well, myself. Pe people want to see cute pictures of you and your fiance. Yeah, there you well, go. Well, I think I think it's more pictures of my garden and cheese and a bit of architecture and maybe some of myself. You're, you have a you, he has a fan base, I will say. <laughs> I, I, I heard a lot of people talking about him after the screening. I remember it's like, oh my god, <laughs> he's taken everyone. Aww. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this. I so appreciate it. It was a great conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And this has been the Outcast presented by Outfest. For more, go to outfest.org/theoutcast. 
The Outcast is executive produced by Ismail El Sharif and Alan Koningsberg. Special thanks to Damian Navarro and the entire Outfest team. Music by West One Music Group. For more information about Outfest, the film festival, the programs, and all the ways that you can help support LGBT voices, go to outfest.org. The Outcast is a production of Milton Ventures Media and Triple Fire Productions. I'm Dave Kittredge. Thank you so much for listening and catch you next time.